So I've had the pleasure of spending some time with Hector Lopinger, a father, a husband, singer, songwriter, and guitarist. A man who's had an interesting journey riding the wave of music the last 25 some odd years. Beginning his journey, as many of us, with high school friends in his late teens. He's played in acts like Diana's Bath, The Shipwrecks, more recently adding a guitar to Shinebox. He's developed and evolved a sound uh, from projects like Logo, a hard driving punk sound, and the very unique and hauntingly satisfying is in Boxcar Hex and the Raleigh Riverbanks. So I invite you to take a journey getting to know Hex, the joy of music brings to him, and the drive to bring his frequency to you. Okay. So, hey Hex, how are you today? I'm doing alright, how are you doing? Good. Good. You gotta tell everybody, what is it about the Raleigh River? Something about water. It's an interesting element in that. We need it to survive, but it controls so much of us. It puts us in peril. Uh, you know, to think of how, look here, how much it's controlled our development here. We've got the highway across there. We have this over here. And, you know, I was working on a set of songs and kind of kept coming back to the water and, and uh, the Rawway River is kind of the thing I, I run into it every day. It runs through my town. It is here. It's kind of became the center of some instrumentals I, w I was working on at the time, and uh, just in my thoughts when I was sort of doing these projects. Very cool. It's always nice to come down here and, and uh, appreciate it. It's, it's uh, power, beauty, it's everything that creates around us. It. So, what's the funniest thing that's ever happened to you at a show? Let's see. Funniest thing has happened to me on stage. I was uh, a roadie for a band called Smith House, and we, we had done kind of about a four or five month tour across, supposed to be across the U.S. Uh, in very Spinal Tap fashion. A lot of shows got canceled, so we never made it across. We made it, I think, about as far as Lawrence, Kansas, Chicago, and you know, that sort of end of it, Mississippi. That's about as far as we made it. We were playing a show in Kansas City. Uh, and the, the bass player, we got on a little later than we were supposed to. The bass player drank a little more than he should have. Always. And uh, you know, those bass players, you know, they, uh, they broke a string, a bass string, which is impressive. Did it on stage. Uh, Been there. And uh, we changed his string without stopping as he was playing because things were going so terrible, why not? <laughs> and uh, didn't miss a beat. That is able awesome. Change the string, and then he, he later threw up in a bucket on stage too. So, you know. G.G. Allen-esque. There you go. 
Uh, I don't know if that's what he was going for, but if there was any sort of, uh, you know. You weren't checking his drawers, so. No, no, I wasn't. I don't know if he was, it was an artistic thing or he was making a statement or he just drank too much. Now this was uh, a punk group? This was, it was like a, uh, kind of like a jazz fusion nice. kind of thing, um, which, you know, eventually developed really into, you know, a rock pop kind of thing after I sort of, you know, left. Um, and uh, I think a lot of the guys in the band had graduated that previous June, so this was sort of their, their sending off into the real world, and, and you know, we all, we tagged along. And it was a lot of fun, you know. A lot of experience got to meet a lot of musicians from around the country I never would have had a chance to do before and also playing in venues around the country It's very, you know, it's a different vibe than, than in New York where um, You know, I think New York you play a show and everyone's kind of have this thing going. What, what do you what do you got? Uh, playing across the country was just more like Oh yeah, great. You know, go out to have a good time. Yeah, well, it's, and and the musicians are allowed to have a good time together, uh, and or, you know we're all you know everyone's supportive. The it's a the circus instead of the show. Yeah, yeah. You know, I yeah I got you. The circus instead of the show. So hey, that, we're gonna... that was a uh, you know it was a great experience, and, and uh, you know definitely gave me some thoughts about you know playing out um, you know in the future I mean, sort of how to conduct yourself and, and, and also how venues should conduct themselves as well. Uh, again, when you get paid in beer, you gain a lot of weight. <laughs> to the gazebo preparing to perform, so I took the opportunity to learn about how he juggles life and music and all of his influences along the way. All right, so I wanted to ask you, since becoming a father, how has that changed you musically? Uh, I think in many ways it, it's, it's, it's motivated me to do it more. Um, and not, not so much that I... Um, you know, don't want to be a part of my life. I very much do, but I think it's for me. It's always been my passion, and my dream, and I want to, uh, you know, in my life show that, you know, if, if you're passionate about something that that is positive and good, you, you should pursue it. Um, you know, no matter what you do. Um, you know, it might not be your job or whatever, but I mean, you know, being passionate about something is a very good thing, and um, you know. Seeing it through and, and acting on it is good too. You need that balance in your life. So, you know, I, I try to, to live that and, 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 you know, show that to my kids on a daily basis. That, that, uh, you know, for me, you know, music is one of my passions and, and I do follow it um, as far as, you know, I can and, uh, you know, still make time for life. Um, 
on the other end too. So, you know, balancing what you need to do in your life and what you want to do and, you know, making sure there's ample time for all of it is, is a challenge, but, you know, it's what makes life worth living. Okay, so would you say your wife is extremely supportive, um, marginally supportive? What's the relationship there with you and your music? I, um, we'll say uh, tolerable, we'll put it that way. Uh, yes, understood. Yeah, it's, <laughs> Been there. It's, uh, you know, I, I think she, she was very uh, supportive of it as, as, you know, we got to know each other and whatnot. But, uh, you know, but there's, there's a lot to life, and uh, uh, you know, we, we all have priorities and whatnot. And uh, you know, to me, I, I, I do my best to make sure that music, you know, has its own place that doesn't, you know, intrude upon you know, other aspects of life that are, you know, that are important. To life. Yes. Okay. Um, one other pers kind of personal question. It's not personal, personal. Um, let's say. Whatever controls the universe, right? You know, whatever controls the universe comes down to you, comes into a form and speaks to you, and says, "I can make sure that your family never has to deal with unwarranted pain or suffering, ever. Unwarranted." Yeah. Now, but you can only play one more song, and you can only play that song for the rest of your life. That's that's what you have to do to make this happen. Could be your song, anybody else's song. What song would you play? I don't, I don't know how much it might, you know, cause uh, pain upon the people around me if I have to play the same song <laughs> all the time. But um, you know, that, that's a tough one. And, and uh, to me, you know, I, I, I kind of got to go back, uh, you know, to, to where my musical roots are. And that's you know a lot of you know early rock and roll roots rock. And, that sort of stuff. So, you know, I'd, I'd probably say it'd be something early Beatles, Please Please Me, up there. Um, saw her standing there. You know, one of those, you know, great little tunes. It's got little interesting hooks to it and what. Just a ton of fun to play. You can do a ton of things with it. And, uh, you know, I probably would get bored, but I, I think I could do a lot of different things with that, with one of those songs. Uh, but, I, you know, Again, I'll see how long everyone around me this lets me live, but uh, you know, it'll probably be something around that era. Diana's Bath was Hex's first real project at Hatch in 93 with high school friends Tom Linder, Chris Smith, and Chris Carbone. They all went to a summer camp near Diana's Bath, New Hampshire, where Hex was first bitten by the bug that find much of his person for years to come. This was a simple group of vocals and guitar that was realized from the two and then with the four track recorder. In conversations with Tom Winter, I've learned how enthusiastic Hex has always been in writing and collaborating and how it's never faded over time. He even confronted Tom after Tom's long hiatus from music to tell him to start writing again, something that Tom thought he wasn't very good at and that he was quite simply getting wrong. Hex said, I write music in the now, you write music people listen to 10 years from now. They created a unique, sometimes eerie sound on that four track recorder. Hex joked about the depth of some of the lyrics. We were young and needed the money. Well, regardless of depth of lyrics, this was a highly fruitful attempt that surely foreshadowed Hex's vision for years to come. Do you say the Beatles are, are your major influence, is your biggest influence from that era? And, and let's say if you broke it down by like decades, from the 50s on, well, what, what would be your, your biggest your, your biggest draws as far as music? You know, in the 50s, I always go back to, you know, Sun Studios, Elvis, uh, Johnny Cash, um, you know, Orbison had, you know, some, some touch in there too, Jerry Lee Lewis. So, you know, if you consider just the, you know, the different genres and whatnot and things going on there, it was pretty wonderful. But, you know, if, if you pick one artist, I, mean, I have to say Elvis because, you know, he, he touched it all. Uh, you know, he was fantastic. Johnny Cash as well. Kind of, kind of similar to what the Beatles did when they came over. They just they, they came in and they just touched everything. Yep. And it's interesting when you look at the '60s in, in, in America. You know, I wasn't alive yet, but a lot of the artists that I am into, uh, American artists, uh, they're learning these 
a lot of these, you know, blues R&B songs from American artists from the 50s uh, through British artists coming out in the 60s. Um, and, uh, you know, so there's obviously, you know, a ton of influence there. And uh, the Beatles came over, they played a lot of, even stolen, a lot of these American kind of pop songs uh, while developing their own craft as song. I wasn't they were, you know, had some excellent stuff too early on. Uh, but, you know, it's just interesting how, when you talk about the Beatles, how they, they sort of took that, the Stones took these songs and, you know, a lot of people say took the balls out of them, but but really introduced those songs and those artists to, to you know the next generation of musicians. Very cool. So you know, '60s I guess would I mean early Beatles to me, uh, up to Rubber Soul, uh, hugely influential uh, to me. Um, into the '70s, you know, like uh, we talked about I Only, you know, Black Sabbath. You know, that, that's a great band, the Deep Purple. Um, I guess the band is, you know, kind of late, late 60s and the 70s. The Grateful Dead. Just a ton of, you know, think of kind of what I play. All those bands sort of mash up in here. <laughs> and a lot of them are coexisting, playing the same bills in the 70s. Um, you know, lots, lots of great music there. You know, 80s. It's a little <laughs> muddier for me. That it's a lot of artists that, you know, I listen to, but I'm, I'm not sure how much influence I take a ton of it. Um, you know, 90s. To Soundgarden to me was one of the first bands I heard that, you know, put a lot of this stuff together to me and said to me, "Wow, anything is possible with music." Um, and then, you know, from the 80s, I, you know. Past the 80s, I went back to a lot of artists, Camper Van Be Beethoven, Black Flag, uh, you know, a lot of those sort of artists, uh, which Ramones in the 70s into the 80s. Um, I kind of, you know, got, got more into that stuff um, later, uh, partially from, you know, Soundgarden, Nirvana, Pearl Jam, a lot of these bands opening up those, those gates for me, much like the Beatles did to American artists, uh, you know, in the 60s. So, yeah, you know, I, I, in a lot of different projects, I play a lot of different music, but because I'm into a lot of different music, to me, it was never, this is heavy metal, this is hard rock, this, it was never that. It was always music. Everything is, you know, someone else can define it. To me, it's music. Um, if I'm into it, I'm into it. I don't need to put a label on it uh, to make it special or fancy in the market. It just, it is what it is. Uh, and I think that kind of comes out my songs and my playing. The Shiprocks formed in 2000, a hardline New York punk sound that's reunited with Diana's Bath alum Chris Smith along with Frank Morris and Ryan Sackreiner while living in Brooklyn. They played the scene with moderate success over the next year and a half, being influenced by late 70s and 80s punk acts like the Dead Boys, the Sex Pistols, as well as the Rolling Stones. Most known tracks are Irish Mob and Civil War Lover, which evolved into Locos Five Minutes for Fighting years later. They did have a one-off reunion in 2004, but with Richard still inside the group, nothing more came of it. We never, we never submitted this, but this was one of my previous bands. We wrote a sync. They were uh, uh, soliciting for uh, jingles for Snap. We went back when they made soda. Long time ago. So it kind of went like this. I'm just a classic iced tea man. And I'm looking for a drink. Reach for the drink that just cannot be beat. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I had a whole 
bridge and stuff too. I'm not gonna touch you. <laughs> Very nice. Very nice. Moco is described accurately as Elvis meets Motorhead. Established in 2014, Hex brought together two talented musicians, Jim Krauss on drums and Anthony Kapowski on bass. Began rehearsals at Jeff Phillips' legendary Dome Studios in California. The trio gelled immediately and formed the tight musical bond. No doubt aided by the few pints at the Michigan Pub for their weekly post wars in the The band played its first gig at the Hookdown, a concert series recording Curry. In discussions with Jim Krause, I learned Hex as a bandmate has changed much since Diana's bad days. Jim, who had been out of bands for many years before answering Hex's Craigslist ad, was blown away by the amount of collaboration that was encouraged. This was Hex's project, but Fuego is all about the music, and his honest, artistic method of pooling talent and letting those who wish to express hold well and added gems to the overall sound. After a couple of years, the group had to take a hiatus to bassist Anthony Feldhausen's help. Unfortunately, tension between the rhythm sections may delay a reunion at times. You, you talked about how music goes on in your head. It's, it's similar for me too, and, and I, I, I understand that's how like the punk folk thing could come together, and, and you did a, you've done a very good job because you, you, both elements are in the music. Um, but when a brainchild like that happens and you get a sound in your head and it starts mashing up, do you have to go right to playing it? Do you have to get it out? Or do you, or you kind of do like a thought experiment with it? How, how, do, you, how do you realize it? I, if, I try to, if I say to myself, I'm gonna remember this later, I'm not. Um, so I'll think of something in the shower or anywhere. Um, if I'm not near a guitar, I got my phone with me, I you know, hum the riff, if it's something lyrical, you write down the lyrics, uh, hum the melody. Uh, I gotta get it down immediately because uh, whatever struck with me at that moment, uh, and, you know, stayed with me to the next moment, um, it's worth exploring to me. And I have to remember it as I, as it's in my head at that point. Uh, what I found is if I try to remember later, it never sounds right. Yeah, exactly. But a lot of times I'll come in and say, you know, I want this to be sort of a, you know, stack soul kind of thing. And it comes out very different when I'm done with it. And that's through the exploration of working through it. Um, what immediately might hit me as one thing might evolve into something else or might actually be something else I just haven't got. Boxcar Hex as a concept began near the end of the Shipwrecks run in 2001. Hex Swago needed to branch out a bit. Having so many melodies in his head, the genres began to merge. And 12 years later, morphed into what would be known as Boxcar Hex and the Broadway River Banks. He started to write, exercising those chords and words, writing an astounding 20 songs in two weeks. And in 2005, the vision received a substantial boost as Hex and Tom Winter re reconnected. Material went back and forth, collaboration and critique fueled the life project. By 2013, the principal act of Boxcar Hex and the Raleigh River Bank started a new chapter of Hex's own folk punk fusion. The band is a fluid march of musicians coming in and out to record and perform what essentially is Hex's solo project. You may see him out alone with his acoustic or playing fully back, or should I say, joined by a band of friends and collaborators. Unfortunately, the Rollway Riverbanks incarnation, including Winter, the Garfunkel to Hex's Simon, missed last year's Cranford Porch Fest. This was due to an injury to Hex's elbow. An infection swelled up and Hex was hospitalized three weeks before the event. With mobility in his hand at a nil, Boxcar Hex decided to opt out of the event rather than risk backing out right before the show. Hex has expressed a willingness to give the event a go later in 2018. All hopes are for Tom Winter's ability to appear as well. That would surely be a crescendo for the two men, rounding out full circle Hex's 25-year odyssey.
I've got 5,000 heartaches weighing on this heart of mine. That's 5,000 reasons you think you'll be unkind. Well, don't mind me wondering when you're going to screw my mind. Well, you look real good with the whiskey glass I've been sipping on all night. And you sound good talking over that Hank song playing all night. But it looks to me like I felt this way before. I've had 5,000 heartaches, and I don't need any more. Well, I've got 5,000 heartaches weighing on this heart of mine. Don't mind me wondering when you're gonna screw my mind. Well, five thousand hearties, five thousand hearties, five thousand hearties. So let's just take our time. That's Fuego Lovinger, everybody. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>